thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, I'll talk about my PhD research. Um, yeah, it's uh, been hard times since last last days for Israel. I'm sure everybody heard, um, but I'm uh, yeah happy to con to to give this talk in any case, despite the hard uh, hard times. So um, yeah, so optical metagenomics via deep learning and information theory. This is the this is the topic of uh, my PhD research, um, and uh, under the supervision of Yoav Shechtman, Professor Yoav Shechtman uh, from Technion and uh, Yuval Ebenstein, Tel Aviv University, collaboration with Eitan Yaakobi and Nir Weinberger, Nir Weinberger from Computer Science in uh, Technion and many other uh, many other wonderful people that uh, help with this research. So um, I'll. Uh, I'll talk about uh, first of all. Let's define metagenomics, um, which is the analysis of uh, the entire genomic information uh, in a sample from an environment. Okay, now um, uh, that that is that is in contrast to you know like genomic traditional genomics, which uh, takes uh, and amplifies a specific uh, section. Of a genome or for a specific organism. Now, the motivation uh, uh, for this uh, research for me personally was uh, cultivation free bacteria identification. I'll talk about it. Um, but there are many other uses of the technology and in general of metagenomics. Um, I'll talk about the technology itself, about optical genome mapping. I'll talk about uh, the computational advancements we did uh, using uh, deep learning and information theory for actual optimization of the method, uh, right? So feel free to stop me if something uh, isn't clear. Um, so for the motivation, uh, bacterial infection di diagnostics nowadays uh, is uh, pretty slow. Um, and uh, sadly, many people die because uh, it takes days to cultivate bacteria from blood samples, for example, uh, until you can actually identify the bacteria and uh, prescribe the correct antibiotic despite all the antibiotic resistance that, that happened today with many bacteria. Um, the identification today is done by either phenotyping with different growth media, uh, mass spectrometry on the proteins inside the bacteria, uh, by PCR directed to specific uh, species, or in r very rare cases, uh, also sequencing. But all those require cultivation. So you have, because they're not sensitive enough to actually just either analyze the very few uh, genomic uh, material of the pathogen in the sample directly, or deal with the low quantity of cells of the pathogen inside. So, uh, so something else should be um, should be done, and uh, for this, uh, I uh, I looked at optical genome mapping as a technology because it provides a way to um, observe single molecules of uh, DNA and uh, map them to uh, genome references. Yeah, and that way, we can actually take a single molecule of DNA and identify which organism it came from. Um, so the definition of the technology is mapping optical images of uh, linearized uh, and labeled DNA fragments uh, to reference uh, genome sequences. Okay, and here you can see uh, an example image of, uh, the, of a DNA molecule. Um, uh, with, which, so essentially, this is a double strand which we can't see, of course, in a microscope, but we do see uh, fluorophores that are attached along the, uh, the double strand. Uh, it's tens of microns in length uh, and uh, multiple thousands of base pair in, uh, in length. Um, so it has been demonstrated by different research groups for uh, either structural variation detections in the human genome, for um, translocations, reversals, insertions in the chromosomes, and of course, for microbial species identification. But uh, the technology is limited in accuracy and in uh, actual utility today um, because of challenges I'll present, uh, both on the experimental side 
and the computational side. Uh, and uh, my aim in, in my PhD research was to uh, uh, make those, uh, like solve those challenges and make this technology useful and maybe being used for uh, things such as uh, pathogen identification and diagnostics. Um, so advantages of the technology of sequencing uh, uh, is uh, first of all, extremely long genome maps, uh, which uh, for applications in human genomics is very important for study of structural variation, et cetera. Uh, much higher sensitivity potentially uh, because uh, if, of a very simple protocol uh, compared to the whole process that is needed um, for uh, for sequencing by synthesis, by uh, uh, when when you have to essentially do shotgun sequencing, etc. So that's the reason. It's a single molecule technique. So that's that's the main advantage. Um, so how to do optical genome mapping? Uh, first of all, we have to linearize uh, DNA. Uh, so uh, there are two ways that uh, we tried in our lab. One uh, on the left, you can see uh, that we take an activated glass surface. Here is me holding a pipette and uh, dragging uh, a droplet uh, containing uh, DNA of a bacteria, of E. coli in this case. Uh, dragging it on, uh, on on a glass surface. And uh, on the left, you can see a microscopy image we took, and uh, you can see the DNA molecules just stretching in straight lines on the glass due to the motion. Another way is uh, a chip we used from BioNanoGenomics. Uh, it, it contains thousands of nanochannels uh, into which uh, DNA molecules can go and uh, linearize uh, by the application of pressure and electric field. So that's two ways by which you can linearize uh, DNA molecules. Uh, but also to create those images, you have to label them because otherwise you won't see anything and you have to reflect information about the genome. So there are multiple ways to label DNA for optical genome mapping. One on the left, you see that's the enzyme-based labeling. So, and we'll focus on this kind of labeling in this talk mainly. Um, so one way is to, uh, is to use a, a nicking enzyme, which looks for four or six letter patterns on the DNA, genome sequence, uh, nicks one of the strands, and then a DNA polymerase incorporates a fluor for there, a fluorescent uh, base pair, uh, base. And uh, another way is to use methyl transferases, which just search for a pattern and with a modification of a cofactor, introduce a fluor for uh, at specific uh, sequence patterns. Another way is affinity-based labeling, by which you can, uh, for example, uh, uh, stain only GC base pairs by uh, denaturation, which is uh, GC or AT selective, or by uh, using some other interpolating uh, molecule, which prevents, which has affinity for AT base pairs. And this way, fluorophores uh, only uh, stain uh, the GC base pairs. So GC base pairs. So that's that's another way to reflect information about the genome, and. Uh, image it uh, in a fluorescent, regular fluorescence microscope, right? So the resulting uh, OGM uh, data we have, it consists of uh, microscopy images uh, like this one. So we take a field of view and we see many DNA molecules. Each line here is a DNA molecule of tens of kilobase, potentially hundreds of kilobase uh, length. And the dots are the fluorophores that attach at the pattern we uh, uh, wanted to label. Uh, and this is a zoom into one of those molecules. Um, and uh, on the right, and the, the data also consists of reference genome sequences, and there are tens of thousands of bacteria being, uh, that already has been sequenced by humanity, and in general, hundreds of thousands of organisms. So we have plenty of data. Now we have to match between, uh, between these images and genome sequences. Um, also, we have the knowledge of the, the sequence pattern we labeled. For example, here we see, okay, let's, if we label the pattern CTTAG on the double strand and DNA, uh, then uh, we can uh, essentially build a database of reference positions in each of those sequences. So we can map between those images to, uh, to those sequences. Yeah, but uh, there are many challenges. So um, on the experimental side, um, total internal reflection microscopy is needed uh, 
because the signal is very low. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, but that's uh, that's a microscopy method that allows to filter out uh, noise from the background um, and only capture uh, light from very close to the cover slip. Uh, and that's important, uh, which induces some experimental challenges. The labeling enzymes uh, have uh, sometimes low efficiency and uh, and we need them to label only what we are looking for and not anything we're not looking for. Uh, and this could be a challenge, so the, this has to be developed for each enzyme. Um, and uh, long enough DNA fragments are needed because we're imaging them with light and uh, fluorescence microscopy. Um, and uh, the, linear, the linearization of the DNA on the surface also has questionable yield. So you have to make sure that all of them or many of them actually stick and linearize. And uh, that's also a challenge. Um, on the computational side, which is the main thing I focused in my uh, uh, research project, um, accuracy nowadays uh, for OGM before uh, uh, our advancements is too low uh, for uh, short DNA fragments. Um, and uh, and uh, and noise from different biochemical and photophysical effects uh, like uh, enzyme labeling efficiency and fluor four um, so uh, inter uh, inter effect between flu uh, neighboring fluor fours etc uh, are not accounted for in the algorithms uh, and uh, this reduces accuracy also non -un non uniform stretching of DNA molecules is also a big uh, problem. Uh, which uh, makes it hard to uh, map them to genome sequences. And the computation time is uh, pretty significant, especially when you are imaging uh, a, a large volume of uh, DNA and you want to map against, uh, let's say, the whole g the, the genome sequences of all known organisms. So I addressed uh, all those challenges. Um, yeah, let me know up to now if anything is uh, not clear about like the method or introduction. Uh, anybody has any questions? All right, so let's go on. Um, so the uh, first of all, uh, we developed a, a deep learning model that uh, allows uh, this uh, mapping problem of um, images of DNA to genome sequences. All right, so our goal is to map an image of DNA molecule to a genome sequence. So we have the reference genome. We know uh, where the positions of the labeled uh, pattern. Let's say I labeled the pat six letter pattern CTT AAG. And, uh, and I know the positions. Now I get the image. I have to map it, go over, over all the possible genome sequences I know and, and match it to the one which is it, it's uh, most matching to and in the right position. So both uh, ways. Um, and uh, we train this uh, uh, convolutional neural net to uh, predict uh, the positions from the images. And uh, then another algorithm that uh, aligns, and I will talk about it, that aligns it to the reference genome. And the resulting accuracy, here you can see uh, the comparison. Uh, we get essentially, so the important line is this one and the blue line, and we get uh, twice more accuracy versus the state of the art for uh, 50 kilobase uh, fragments, uh, which is significant. Yeah, and uh, so how, how did we make this model? How did we train it? So uh, first of all, we uh, considered the simulated data, first of all, um, in which uh, all the different effects uh, that we could model uh, were incorporated, a labeling efficiency of the enzyme, off-target labeling, a point spread function, meaning, um, the optical uh, spread of uh, each fluorophore uh, is significant. You see, it's not just a dot, it's not just one pixel, it's it's a blob, right? Because uh, resolution is limited, of course, um, and dependent on the, on the wavelength of light, of course, and the numerical aperture of the objective, uh, and the stretching of the DNA molecule. So all those things were simulated and, um, and uh, the neural net uh, learned to predict the uh, exact uh, uh, locations of, uh, of uh, each fluorophore in such an image. And uh, so the, in green are the ground truth and the blue are the predicted uh, positions, uh, which uh, is pretty accurate 
uh, given the fact that you, here, for example, you have a floor four, which is actually two floor fours overlapped on the same location, uh, but from the shape of the of the <clears throat> resulting blob of light, the neural net is able to discern that there are actually two floor fours there, which is very important for increasing the accuracy and extracting as much more information from uh, the uh, genome from the from the DNA molecule to the genome sequence. Uh, the loss function, I will not go into details unless anybody's uh, really interested and can go back into that and uh, explain the loss function used. Um, and then, the, we, then we have the alignment algorithm, which is inspired by, I don't know if uh, people heard about the needleman wunsch algorithm, which is used for uh, sequence uh, alignment in traditional genomics. Um, and uh, and uh, this is a dynamic programming algorithm. So uh, I developed an alternative version of it uh, for uh, mapping between an image of a DNA molecule and the sequence. Uh, when we know what what uh, what's, what uh, sequence patterns have been labeled, and uh, this equation uh, kind of uh, defines the energy equation for the path for the alignment path. And here we can see like an example alignment path that could be solved between uh, those two objects. Uh, so that's the alignment algorithm. Um, now, uh, to improve the method further uh, beyond the uh, twice accuracy that we showed above the state of the art, um, we also employed transformer models for creating a dimensionality reduction of both the images and the genome sequences, uh, creating an embedding, and then uh, essentially creating a retrieval model. So very similar to uh, text retrieval or speech retrieval that is being used uh, nowadays in commercial applications. It's inspired by uh, the work from OpenAI, which is called uh, CLIP, uh, Learning Transferable Visual Models from Natural Language Supervision, in which uh, they uh, uh, improved upper, upon the state of the art of image classification, so let's say an image is a dog or an image is a cat, uh, by just training on massive amounts of data in the wild uh, for pairs of an image and uh, and uh, the caption that uh, that describes uh, the image. So similarly to that, uh, we can what we did is is we trained on pairs of DNA uh, molecule images versus uh, genome sequences. So you can see the resemblance here. Um, and we essentially trained two encoders. So here they had a text encoder and image encoder. We have an image encoder and a genome encoder. Uh, and they are trained so that so that each uh, you give a batch of, let's say, 1,000 pairs of uh, image and uh, genome sequence. And then uh, you train the model to predict that only the uh, ones on the diagonal, so the matching uh, genome sequences to the matching images should have a high similarity score, uh, let's say cosine similarity, and low similarity score for uh, off-diagonal entries. So, um, and, 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 uh, and this way you can train the embedding to bring those, uh, to, to first of all, dimensionality, do dimensionality reduction and bring uh, related uh, objects in the genome space and the image space closer. And of course, those are unrelated, farther apart. This is the loss uh, that also OpenAI Clip uses, which is just cross entropy loss uh, on the similarity matrix uh, between uh, the two modalities. And the transformer model used was uh, WAVLM, uh, developed by uh, Microsoft Research, and they used it for uh, speech to text. Uh, applications in which uh, you have to either either retrieve text by uh, speech or uh, or just do speech to text tasks. And this problem is kind of similar because we have a genome sequence and then an kind of analog um, noisy version of the genome sequence, which is the image. So there are parallels with speech and text in this uh, case. And it appeared that this model worked uh, much better than other models. Um, now, the advantage of this embedding retrieval model over the localization alignment model I presented before 
is uh, first of all uh, computation speed. The complexity of this algorithm is logarithmic in genome length compared to linear in genome length for the localization alignment model. And that's because when you create a dimensionality reduction and you embed both the genome and the image into Euclidean space of low dimension, you can use algorithms such as TreeSearch, um, KD3 and others to uh, essentially uh, find a query in the reference uh, in the logarithmic uh, time. Uh, and this translates to, for example, for a thousand X faster when we test it on human genome da data. Uh, and uh, compared to like, it can take 24 hours uh, for the human genome for 200 X coverage, uh, also an experiment uh, we did. Uh, so another, another advantage is that it learns from real data compared to simulated data for the, for the previous model, uh, which is an advantage because it utilizes all unknown physical chemical factors in OGM, which, which we even don't know uh, about, but it just learns it from the data. Uh, and the simulated data, of course, doesn't take those effects into account. So it potentially uh, will provide a much higher accuracy, uh, but it can overfit because data is limited. So uh, you depend on a lot of data. You have to uh, tens of thousands of uh, DNA molecules have to be imaged. Um, so, and of course, in simulated data, you have infinite data. So that's the comparison. Um, now, uh, another work we did is as optimization of the experimental uh, parameters themselves. So except uh, then improving the algorithm for decoding uh, those DNA molecule images, we want to optimize uh, the labeling pattern itself. So we want to choose the right enzymes to optimize the process. So there is a wide playground of labeling patterns. So uh, in, in most experiments we did, we worked with this CTT AAG labeling enzyme, which, uh, which labels this pattern on the genome. But essentially a bacteria have developed so many restriction modification systems and we can use those enzymes from those systems and they recognize uh, thousands of different four letters, six letters, seven letter patterns. Uh, so there is a white playground, uh, and but to understand actually which one to choose, we want to understand which labeling patterns extract the most information. And to quantify information, uh, we use information theory because information theory uh, allows for the analysis of the information as the object, contrary to other theories in physics that talk about mass and other quantities. Information theory deals about the quantity of information. I won't go into details because I'm sure no, uh, not everybody is familiar with this. I'll just say that Claude Shannon developed it in 1948 and it, it allowed for breakthroughs in communication, storage, uh, and uh, everything uh, important for us in technology uh, today um, because we could understand and quantify the, the information capacity in communication channels, etc. cetera. So, um, so we did an analysis of this for uh, information theory analysis for this problem of optical genome mapping. And the information theory model for, uh, for it, uh, in simple terms, is uh, uh, defined like this. So you have uh, the message which is transmitted over the communication channel, which is a genome position in a genome sequence. And in the end, what we want to decode is the estimated genome position. So where essentially this DNA fragment, which we imaged in a microscope, where in the genome and in which from which genome sequence it came from. So we want to decode that. And there is a whole process involving noise and uh, same as in communication channels, cellular communication, wired communication, fiber optic communication. Um, <clears throat> and uh, to simplify this analysis, what we assumed is we can def uh, both divide the genome sequence into bins of 1000 kilobase pairs and the image itself and then count the number of fluorophores or appearances of the labeled pattern on the genome sequence or on the, on the image. And then we derived an equation uh, which estimates the probability of error uh, depending on parameters uh, which are um, uh, which essentially are uh, dependent on the size of the DNA fragment, the, si the size of the whole genome uh, reference database we want to uh, identify DNA molecules from, so the number of bacteria, the size of their genomes, etc., and the noises that are inherent in the in the process. 
which allows us to kind of estimate the capacity of this uh, information capacity of this process. Um, and then uh, it actually gives you useful predictions. So, so you can use that model to choose for the optimal uh, enzyme out of the thousands of potential enzymes to label the DNA molecules so that you have the most information from these blurry images with dots, right? So you want to map them to genome sequences. You want the most information possible. Um, and uh, here in this, uh, in this chart, I plot uh, the probability of error uh, predicted by the theory for um, thousands of different enzymes uh, of different labeling patterns. Actually, here the blue dots are all the possible six-letter combinations that could be labeled on genome sequences. And this is shown both for the human genome and some subset of selected bacterial genomes, which are common in pathogens. Um, and uh, highlighted are also some common patterns which are used commercially. And you can you can actually, by the prediction of the model, you can get to up to 10 times and even maybe 100 times uh, lower error probability by just choosing the right uh, labeling pattern for the experimental conditions uh, for the specific uh, genome uh, target. Yes, and and uh, and we're looking forward also to to test this experimentally and uh, look at those uh, very special uh, patterns and maybe try to label them and uh, and see if it improves the experimental uh, results of optical genome mapping considerably and making it actually useful. Um, so to conclude, the research impact for optical genome mapping uh, is uh, from uh, that we did is from two uh, two sides. One is the deep learning models that improve the accuracy uh, up to 2x for uh, short 50 kilobase fragments. It actually allows for uh, working with shorter DNA fragments. It simplifies the protocol, the ex DNA extraction protocol. It reduces cost. It's much more robust to experimental conditions, such as uh, non-uniform stretching of DNA fragments, different noise factors happening in the images. So you can also simplify the devices and uh, et cetera. Uh, and re a significant reduction in computation time, which is also important, uh, especially when you want to do fast pathogen detection in hours or minutes, potentially. Um, and the, the information theory analysis allows for the choice of, uh, of optimal uh, labeling enzymes, uh, which uh, reduces, can potentially reduce up to 10x the error rate. Um, it also explains the effect of different uh, noise factors on the accuracy, allowing for um, choosing and optimizing the experimental parameters. So now we can understand the problem, you know, so we can understand which parameter is more important uh, for example, what's the effect of the genome database size? Is it logarithmic? Is it linear uh, in that uh, parameter? And also allows for uh, essentially knowing in advance before you were doing an experiment or building a device which does optical genome mapping, you can estimate its accuracy. So that's the uh, use, usage of the theory for that. Those are uh, two papers uh, we published in bioinformatics and one more uh, should come uh, soon. Uh, yeah, so uh, I thank uh, my uh, home institute at Technion. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for listening, and I'm open to questions.